Okay, welcome to lesson four. Uh, we're looking at one of the most famous works of maybe of all time in terms of science and biology specifically. Uh, we're looking at the topic of the origin of species, which is also the title of Darwin's book that is maybe one of the most famous pieces of literature in the biology field. Uh, so Darwin's actually his second book where he looked at describing and, and discussing the different types of species that have evolved. And he proposed the, ultimately the theory of evolution that we now know today. The underpinning ideas of the theory of evolution was, was proposed in this book. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was definitely contra like controversial at the time. In, in 1859, it wasn't exactly a place and time where new ideas that challenged specifically the dogma of the, the religious institutes that were in power at that time. But ultimately, it kind of did prevail. Uh, so the question that I asked with regards to the notes is that, you know, why would Darwin be nervous to publish his theory? It, it, that main concept of that religious teachings, it went against it. Um, and a lot of people were unable to kind of travel and look at his observations because of where he did it. Uh, another scientist at that time, Alfred Wallace, had come up with a similar idea or theory uh, without some of the evidence that Darwin had. And that's kind of why we know Darwin today as being the father of the theory of evolution. So what is the theory of evolution specifically? What is the theory of evolution by natural selection? Uh, as we move through the rest of this unit, we will hearken back to this main idea of natural selection being the the process with which we use to describe evolution. And the idea of natural selection is, it's a way that nature or the environment specifically favors the reproductive success of certain traits. And we talked a lot about traits with regards to genetics last unit. We're gonna talk a lot about successful traits in this unit. Ultimately, at the end of the day, how nature selects for it is, it's not really something we can get in too much detail with regards to this unit and with regards to this class, but I'll do my best to simplify it as much as possible in the context with which we need to know. So reproductive success is described as the ability to pass on genes from one generation to the next, and it's a measure of an offspring and the individual that has the ability to survive and reproduce. So species or individuals that have the ability to reproductive, uh, to successfully reproduce, they're said to have traits that nature selects for that allow for it to set to reproduce. So the, the main theory of natural selection, it's broken down into a couple of different pieces that I want to spend some time looking at. There's going to be the idea that it's it's three main separate parts of the of the scientific method that we've kind of talked about in this class. My hope is that you definitely talked about it in grade nine and grade 10. But the idea that what Darwin saw, uh, those observations, which led to him to making inferences, which were then able to help solidify or help to found the idea or theory that he created ultimately. So uh, the first three ideas or observations that I wanna talk about were that he saw that each generation produces more offspring than there are adults. Uh, this idea that if you give birth to, uh, a species gives birth to 10 offspring and you know every generation, it's always gonna have way more offspring than the adults that we see. And so this is an interesting observation that he saw in a lot of species in the Galapagos where they would have four, five, six, even offspring, but uh, they didn't all make it and survive to adulthood. The idea that populations do not grow in size was, or continue to grow in size was another idea. How come species don't logarithmically increase in their population? They tend to reach a stable population at a certain point or at once they get to that stable population, they don't continue to increase in number. And that was an observation he saw as well. And then finally, the, the last observation that ties to the inference that we will discuss is that food and resources are limited. There's a finite number of resources and food within a certain area that these species can survive and live in. And that finiteness, the population does not grow as well as that there are way less adults than there are offspring. It all led to the inference that individuals have to compete for resources. And this is the first major inference that Darwin was able to make based on what he saw in the Galapagos. The idea that there was this competition going on between species and be within species to survive, for lack of a better word.
the last two observations I want to talk about that connect to the second inference that he made were that the individuals vary in a population. There's a lot of variation within the population. When we look at even just in our class, the variation between hair color, eye color, skin color, height, what have you. There's so much variation within a population and within a species. And Darwin really saw that uh, within some of the things that he observed on the Galapagos. Birds of a similar species or the same species had multitude of variations of color, weight, size, height, song, calling, all that type of stuff, that variation within that population. And that many of those variations are what's called heritable, which we learned about in last unit, or they're passed from parent to offspring. And then those two main observations allowed for him to make the inference that some individuals are going to inherit traits that increase their chances of survival and reproduction. And it's that increased chance of survival and reproduction which makes them more fit for survival and reproduction. And that in combined with the idea that those individuals need to compete for resources led to the theory that the idea or the idea behind natural selection in that beneficial traits are given or for a given environment become more common in populations over time and after each generation. If a trait is very helpful when it comes to helping a species or an individual survive, chances are that trait will continue to propagate within that population so long as the environment stays the same. And so it's it's a bit of a, a big idea. I mean, it is the big idea in biology with regards to evolution. These five observations, the two inferences, and then the one major idea or theory that Darwin came up with. But ultimately, uh, we've kind of seen a lot of this stuff already in our class, both in this unit and last unit with regards to specifically the variation in a population, as well as those heritable traits passed on. But it's the first three observations that we'll kind of talk a little bit more about, as well as the other two, but ultimately those main ideas. So what does this actually mean? Well, in other words, he realized that a healthy population produced many more offspring than could possibly survive and reproduce and those individuals and populations exhibited variations. So some of the individuals in these situations had a much better chance at surviving than others. And as a result of that, the traits that allowed for that increase in survivability, they'd be passed on to offspring. So the advantageous traits depend on the environment. But if they had those traits, they're more likely to survive, more likely to reproduce, and more likely to pass on those genes. And it leads to the idea of what's called survival of the fittest. That fitness is the idea of it increases that reproductive success. If a species or if an individual is deemed to be fit, they, are, have, a, they have a higher chance at reproducing. And that higher chance of reproducing means that they have a higher chance of passing on those traits that help. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's cyclical in nature. Individuals who are able to pass on their genes are, are considered fit. So some examples that we've talked about in class, uh, one example specifically with that bacterial, uh, with bacterial growth that is resistant to specific types of antibiotics, they have a higher fitness because they are able to survive and pass their genes on. Uh, when we look at peacocks, it's a really good example to, to discuss in terms of you only ever really see male peacocks with that type of plumage. And, and the more, I guess, beautiful the plumage is, the more colorful, the more uh, abstract the shape and designs are, the more likely they are to attract a mate. And the more likely they are to attract a mate, the more likely they are to pass on their genes. And then the last example with regards to, to reindeer or deer specifically, uh, or any type of antlered creature, like any type of antlered creature, uh, the stronger and larger their, uh, their antlers are and their muscles are, they're more likely to survive and pass on their genes anytime they have to compete. So let's, we're going to look at the idea of adaptations next. And the, the concept of adaptations revolves around that it's a characteristic or trait that allows that individual to have a higher chance of survival and, and reproduce as a result of it. So it's that increase in an individual's chance of survival. So for example, humans, um, we have what's called bipedalism. It allows us to stand upright and move on two feet. And that evolutionary trait, when it did come to fruition, allowed for us to be higher above stand tall and stand above the grass line so we could see potential predators in the distance that may or may not be of harm to us. So that ability to stand upright, the species within that species at that time, the individuals that could stand upright had a higher chance of survival because they could see their predators coming at them. The ones that didn't, 
Well, they didn't stand upright. They probably got eaten and they probably didn't pass on their genes as a result of it. Another concept that we'll look at um, with regards to uh, adaptations is the, the consistent idea with regards to Darwin and what he observed in the Galapagos finches. This is something I'm gonna bring up quite often with regards to these lessons. Uh, and the idea that if we look at each of these in a snapshot, we'll be able to kind of really see and determine how adaptations play a role in evolution. So when we look at that first window, and we can look at the first two windows really and truly, uh, when the ancestral population of finches first kind of arrived in the Galapagos, they had what's called medium-sized beaks, they ate medium-sized seeds, and they kind of had enough food, but they kind of didn't really because most plants in the Galapagos have larger seeds. And so this original ancestral population, once it arrived there, it, it had some food, but it didn't really quite have access to the vast majority of food that was available on the island on account of the seeds of the plants being so large. So over time, and when I say over time, I mean thousands, if not tens of thousands of years, over time, uh, the population grew. And it grew until there was what's called a limited food supply. And we don't really spend too much time talking about it in general with regards to this class, but uh, food supply and that limited food supply in terms of population dynamics, which you'll look at next year in grade 12, it's a major concept that needs to be taken into consideration. And in this example, we see how, you know, once that food supply started to be limited, uh, we start to see some variation in beak sizes because if, there's not enough food for that species specifically as a whole, that's when variation within that population will start to come up and then we maybe start to see some adaptive traits that will allow for those finches to be better at surviving. So again, over a long period of time, there's competition. The finches with large beaks are at an advantage. They are able to eat the larger seeds. They have way more access to food. And if they have more access to food, they're likely to survive. And if they're likely to survive, they're likely to pass on those genes. So birds with larger beaks are what's considered more fit and they will survive and reproduce. And then lastly, when we look at the process repeating itself, large beaks will become more frequent in the population over time as that growth of the population continues to rise. And over time and over many generations, you would start to expect the population to be more representative of what the food supply provides. So if 60% of the food are larger seeds, we would expect 60% of the population approximately to have a beak that would be able to consume that food. Oh. Uh, so that's it for this lesson. Uh, if you have questions, please, as always, post on that document or come on to office hours and ask. Thank you.